Okay, we're live. And so far, there's the three of us. <laughs> are we broadcasting? Yep. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. We are live from the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. I'm uh, Charles Shepard, the CEO, Chief Curator. And I'm so proud to be here tonight with my guest, Jeff Fleming, executive Executive Director at the Huntington Museum of Art, and Chris Hatton, the Huntington Museum's of Art Senior Curator and the Curator of American Impressionism. Tonight, we're talking about the exhibition American Impressionism, Treasures from the Daywood Collection, which is drawn entirely from the collection of the Huntington Museum of Art in West Virginia, now on view at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Welcome, Jeff and Chris. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Here. Yeah. Glad Glad to be here with you and sh sharing lots of uh, things, including things that are not part of the topic tonight. But <laughs> if, I, if I could ask you to start out, if you could tell us a little bit about the collectors of these wonderful treasures that we're exhibiting presently, Arthur Dayton and Ruth Woods Dayton, how, how did this collection come to be and how did it come to you? Well, uh, the, the Daytons were, they were really kind of West Virginia blue bloods, you know, their, their families were very prominent. They were judges and congressmen and so on, lawyers, lots of lawyers in the family. It's kind of an interesting story about how they got together because their families, going back to the Civil War, they were on opposite sides. One was Union, one was Confederate. But they were, they were both also only children, too, and they got together and married. And on their wedding day, they received one of the paintings you have on view there, the Ross Sterling Turner Munich Landscape. I believe it's in the show there. So, yeah. you know, they, they, it, it took them a few years to get started collecting art, but once they did, they dove in head first. And, uh, and I think, you know, they did things the right way. They bought things that they liked any mention that I've ever seen of them thinking, you know, I'm going to buy this and sell it later or something like that, you know, to make money on it. It was mainly for their home. Um, they, you know, it was a really a reflection of them. They, they really just wanted what they liked. And uh, so, you know, again, I think that's a great thing. And they bought from prominent shows like the Carnegie International that was uh, in Pittsburgh, which was near where they, you know, they, Arthur went to college at West Virginia University in Morgantown, which is right near Pittsburgh. And they, uh, they really sought out the, the best galleries in the country and uh, particularly Macbeth Gallery in New York City, which was the first uh, American gallery to specialize in American painting. So they got a lot of their best works from there. Now they were very conservative in their tastes. Uh, you know, they didn't start collecting till after the Armory show, but it was like it never happened with them. They, uh, you know, they, they were not interested in modernism at all. They liked beautiful paintings. They loved the American Impressionists. So that's what they filled their house with. And uh, they just had this collecting mindset. Now, Arthur, I, I don't, you know, again, you don't know much about him, but he was, his book collection was probably as good or better than his painting collection. He had uh, all of the first four fo uh, first folios of Shakespeare. He had, you know, lots of Charles Dickens works and Mark Twain. Really, he had about seven thousand books that he gave to the that ended up going to the West Virginia University Library. It's a fantastic collection. Oh, how wonderful! Yeah, in fact, a few years ago, we borrowed their first folio to have on view at the museum. It was really quite a, a treat to have that. And Ruth, once Arthur, Arthur was sort of the moving force early on, but but uh, he passed away at a you know un, uh, at a younger age, I guess. And but Ruth carried on and really uh, you know picked up the pace when she founded the Daywood Gallery, a small gallery in Lewisburg, West Virginia, and began buying a lot of lot more work for them. And they, and again, they were very strongly tied to West Virginia. They wanted their collection to stay here. And uh, they were just really generous people. In fact, just recently, we bought a painting from the Charleston Public Library that Arthur Dayton had given them years ago, uh, Ruger Donahoe painting that you know has a plaque on it 
and the library had just changed directions. They didn't really have any place to put it. So we, we bought it and reunited it with the rest of the Daywood collection. So again, they were terrific. Genuines through and through and uh, just uh, voracious collectors. Well, and there, there's really something wonderful about uh, a couple who stay true to what they like yeah. and, you know, build a, you know, concerted collection around that, around their tastes, around their interests. Mm -hmm. And, you know, later in, in, in life, as, as we view this collection, you see the solidarity piece to piece. Mm -hmm. and they're stunning pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're very proud of it. Uh, you know, I mean, and again, there's you only have a small portion of it, so there's lots more, lots of great, you know, lots of things like works on paper, like an Edward Hopper, which was just at the Indianapolis Museum of Art in the Hopper show that was there, and uh, you know, uh, John Lafarge and. Winslow Homer, you know, there's lots of great stuff that, you know, is not traveling right now, so. Well, I went, I went down to Indianapolis to see that show, and it was really quite a stunner. Yeah, well, you, then you looked at one of our paintings there. <laughs> yeah, I think we did. A little landscape of, of uh, Edward Hopper's, yeah. Jeffrey, um, in your position, it, does it uh, require uh, a, a certain amount of bravery to put a collection like that out on the road in a traveling exhibition. Are you ever nervous about that? I think we're nervous when anything travels. But uh, one of the things that happened when uh, Ruth uh, Dayton gave the collection to the museum was that they, she wanted and was agreeable to having parts of it travel every year. And for a long time, that really didn't happen. And it's one of the things I wanted to get going again because the collection is in a, of exceptional quality and getting that out and getting our name out that we have this kind of work in our collection here in West Virginia. I think it's, it's great for West Virginia and it's great for the museum itself. Oh, I, I think you're, you're so, so right about that. And, and yet um, I think we all know how tough it is to kind of break into the market of having an exhibit that could travel to another institution. And what, what institution would that be? And, you know, do you, what do you charge for that? And how much is it involved to transport it and insure it? it? Sometimes it's so complicated, I think people back down from sharing. Yeah, we've, we've been working on this for a couple of years now. I mean, there was a lot of preliminary work that went into it and, you know, like writing and choosing the works and building crates and all, the whole thing. So, yeah, it's a complicated process. There's no question about it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But but I have to tell you something too, as a as a as a compliment to you both and your institution. When we got the uh, the first you know mailer describing the fact that this show might be offered to travel, we were jumping up and down. You did a beautiful job of presenting what it was, and what a great collection. You know, it makes another institution really excited about getting it and proud to show it good well, i know they've it's fully booked i think you know through the international art and artists so everyone else must feel the same way because we've got a lot you know several bookings for the next couple of years oh that's that's wonderful to hear and that's a good group to work with and in fact we're thinking of working with them too because mm -hmm. it's it's almost too much of a job to do yourselves yeah. Oh, yeah. That's exactly it. And, you know, having working with people who have that expertise in sending out collections of varying types and sizes across the country, and in some cases around the world, those are the people you want to work with, because you can trust that your things are going to be handled correctly, protected, and are going to go to institutions that meet a certain level of competency to handle them. That, that's exactly right. They, they check off all the boxes. They make sure that wherever it's going, it's going to be safe there. It's going to be cared for in a proper way. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've worked with them for some years and have a great level of trust. Uh, and so, as I say, when we first heard word of your exhibit being available, you know, we were, we were kind of jumping up and down for this. Yeah. This, yeah, this looks great. great. And, and actually, you know, we're, we're big fans of what you do there mm -hmm. and, and who you partner with. So that, that all led out to a good thing, I think. 
And now, in the terms of the Daytons, do you think that they had an early relationship with your museum, or did that emerge later? That actually, they emerged, that emerged much later. Uh, we were organized in 1947 and opened in 1952. And so we've been open quite a time. And, and Arthur Dayton had died in 1948, and Ruth had basically installed her collection in Lewisburg, a next, in a building next door to their home there, which was called Daywood, to honor both their two names. And it wasn't until about 15 or 16 years after she had installed it there that she started to really decide that she couldn't keep this up in terms of she was getting older and there wasn't really anybody to take it on when she was gone. And so to find a place that could handle it was going to be key. And that's when a couple of, of people from Huntington sort of stepped in. John Kerr, who was the director here, as well as Paul McCrate, who was the president, sort of contacted her and reached out and said, well, you know, we would be a good home for this. And would you consider giving us the money to build an addition to house your collection? And, and Ruth Dayton wouldn't have, have anything to do with that. She, she thought they had invested enough money in the collection itself and that if an institution wanted it, they should ante up the money. But of course, at the time, the museum didn't have the money to do that. But a few years later, the Doherty Foundation gave us a major grant to basically double the size of our museum. And they decided to go back to her and say, maybe now it's attractive to you because we're going to have the space for it. And she spoke to her advisors and sort of would, jumped right on board at that point. You know, that, that, that's particularly interesting in that I think a, a number of collectors uh, of, of paintings, prints, glass, whatever, uh, react the same way. It's like, I'm willing to give you my collection and I've spent my life and my fortune to get this collection, but why can't you build me a building? <laughs> and, and I think it's not that we don't want to, mm -hmm. but boy, that's, that's kind of difficult sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Our, our founding actually came about in that way. There was a well-to-do gentleman here in Huntington, an attorney, and worked with the CNO Railroad, but he, he offered the land that we sit on and his collection if the people in Huntington would build the building. And so, you know, it worked out great. I mean, it's, we've been going for almost 70 years now, but uh, yeah, but that was his wish. I think he wanted the community to be invested in it, you know? And I, I thought, I think that was a very wise move. Uh, he, yes, I think, I think you're absolutely right, Chris. It's, it's something that if you're sitting in our chairs, you wish the news was different, but I understand that the donor, the major donor thinks, if the community doesn't care, why do I have to care? Exactly, yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, here in Fort Wayne, uh, Theodore Theme, who, uh, was a, a wealthy owner of a knitting mill. He loved the idea of having a museum. And there was a group that had been talking about it for a long time, but they, they didn't have their act together. So he finally got exasperated and said, I'll, I'll give you a, a check for this much money and I'll give you 10 or 12 paintings, but you got to get your act together and incorporate and actually do the same thing you're saying. Get the community yeah. behind it and build a building yeah. or buy a building. A yeah. And they did. And I think that your institution and our institution are probably on more stable ground because of that. Right, yeah, I agree. Could, could I ask you for a minute to, um, I'm, I'm just very eager to hear about other things in the collection because I know you have great things in your collection. Uh, but you, do you want to hear about the Daywood and what else we have in there? Uh, well, I love about the Daywoods and I love about other things that yeah. I kind of like little secrets the public doesn't know about. I'll hold up that. This is a catalog we did of the Daywood collection, but you can see the Child Hassan flag painting oh, out of there. That's, that's one of our real treasures. But we have we have an incredibly diverse collection. We have uh, we ha we actually in 1952 when we opened, we had this uh, great big firearms collection that's that has remained on view for about 70 years now. Wow. So. It's a lot of very early, you know, European decorated firearms. Okay, so that's one thing. When we go through our accreditation process, the people that visit us say, uh, how did you get this, you know, these diverse collections? Like, 
Well, we have we have wonderful contemporary prints. Uh, we have a huge glass collection, and I know you said you guys have a glass collection as well. Yeah, we have uh, British silver. We have uh, wonderful early portraits like Joshua Reynolds and company. Uh, we have uh, a fantastic collection of 19th century French painting, Barbizon School, and realist painting we have jeff help me out here we've got <laughs> <laughs> you've got an amazing folk art collection yeah, we have yeah we have oh that's terrific amazing folk art collection we have a, a, a large collection of haitian painting uh we have uh near eastern collection which is amazing a gallery with with all uh near eastern uh islamic prayer rugs we have a uh major collection of those so you know it's kind of like you name it we have it <laughs> we have <great laughs> so, yeah yeah so yeah. your storage vaults are probably chock full correct they are they yeah. are yeah yeah we have to think twice about big paintings anymore you know trying to fit those in the story yeah where are they going to go right. where are they going to go yeah, we were one of the recipients of the Bogle collection, you know, the 50 works for 50 states. So we we have 50 works from that collection. So, again, we've got things from, you know, ancient Egyptian things all the way to contemporary prints and paintings. And well, that's pretty wonderful. Now, that also must mean a lot to your audiences that the variety and the diversity is so great that yeah. you you kind of cover everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I may think I just want to see those beautiful uh, firearms, but then I get in there and I, I like the prints and I, yeah, I like the yeah. paintings and my yeah. interests change. Yeah. 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 So yeah. we can, I mean, we like, you know, I like to feel that people can come up to the museum and they'll find something they really like here, you know, because there's such a variety that, uh, plus we have 50 acres of land. So if, they don't like what they see in the museum. They can go on a hike and enjoy nature. So. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty perfect. Yeah. Particularly for this time, that's really good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. you're going to be able to come and be safe and yeah. and yeah. be indoors and outdoors at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, going back to impressions for a minute, um, what is it that's what do you think strikes your audiences about American impressionism? You know, we all we all know that they probably got their cue from the French Impressionists, but American Impressionism is is very strong and yet very different. Yeah, I, I think the uh, you know the, the the American painters that picked up Impressionism, uh, you know, it had lost its sort of radical edge by the time it got to America, and so what they did was take the technique and apply it to American scenes. So a lot of what I'm looking at behind you there with some of the, the paintings of, you know, bridges and streams and things and hillsides in America. I think that was, that was really important to people at the time. They were trying to forge this American art. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I read an article about what is American in American art that was written back in the twenties or sometime? They really wanted to create this identity, of, you know, and, and American art. So, you know, Child Hassan may have seen Monet's flag paintings in France. He came back to America and went to, you know, in New York City and painted the parades there, you know. And it, but it was very American in terms of scenery, and I think I think people really identified with that. There was this longing for a national identity. I mean, one of the paintings you have there is Willard Metcalf's uh, Kittery Mansion. It's a yeah. big old house in Maine. I've actually visited and gone through it at different times. But that was the type of thing, you know, they it connected, uh, you know, the American story with, with beautiful painting, I think. So, you know, I think that was the key. And it remained popular, really, for years and years and years after the European, you know, model had sort of waned and they'd moved on to expressionism and things like that. So, uh, but, you know, for Arthur Dayton, this is what he really liked. He loved the American Impressionists. Well, you know, the, I found that the Kittery piece, particularly moving to me, I grew up in Maine and I, I knew that house 
oh, yeah? on, a, on a very constant basis. Oh, wow. I loved it. But I think you're, I think you're onto something, Chris. I think that the, the, the notion originally in this country of maybe, maybe the visual arts weren't as important as the architecture, so we could have a national architecture. I think Thomas Jefferson uh, mm -hmm. spoke to the need to ignore the, the visual arts and concentrate on, on a national architecture. But, you know, once you got that done, you know, people uh, were eager to find out what, what does our nation produce? Right. And, you know, think of, you think about Benjamin West uh, being the first American to go back and actually train an academy in Europe and then run that academy in England uh, and bring over quite a few people to learn from him. That, that's a particular point of pride for all of us as Americans, I think. Yeah, but even up until the Impressionist time, Americans were still buying so much European art. You know, that's what the Barbizon School. Yep. That they sold more paintings in America than they did in France you know, because all the industrialists, they all wanted that kind of work. And uh, so we were still looking to Europe. And I think the Impressionists really helped boost this American school here, you know, and, and develop lots of oh, professional artists here. I, I think you're, you're so correct in that. I, I think that many of the people building fortunes earlier in America wanted to have kind of some some uh, cachet rub off on them from the nobles. Right. Yeah, sure. yeah. And, you know, going to buy that European work uh, would, would help them do that. And of course, many museums received that work. So, you know, we're happy too. But yeah. I think when American Impressionism launched, it started to talk to, to us about the beauty of America. And, and in, indeed, I, I've read this many times and I think it's true uh, that the American countryside was less developed than anything in Europe. So actually here's God's country. Here's this blessed land that mm -hmm. you can still see acres and acres of wilderness and wonderfulness. And it hasn't been, taken over by society yet yeah. that right. that's inspiring yeah yeah but and then the impressionists didn't necessarily need big panoramic scenes like beer stat or church yeah you know, that's you're right you know like one of my favorite paintings in the daywood is the little julian alden weir picture of his farm that he did you guys have it on view but you know they could just walk down their lane there and see set up a, an easel and start painting right there on their own property. So, you know, it was beautiful and familiar to people there, I think. So, well, and it, and it, it points you in the direction of appreciating what's around you. Right. This is yeah. Right in front of your nose. Uh -huh. And, and that, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. 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 Now, yeah. given the size of your collection and the diversity of your collection, uh, which, which I think puts you ahead of most museums, but do, do you worry about space? Do you worry about running out of room? Uh, I, you know, I, th I think if it's quality, <laughs> if it's quality work that's coming in, we'll find a way, you know? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've got a, a lot of objects in the collection and it really, provides a lot of flexibility in what we can show. Um, you know, right now we've got some great shows. We've got the, uh, a show on the Bauhaus right now. And a good portion of it comes from our own collection. We've been collecting that recently. We also have a great show of Harry Bertoia's work, the sculptor and oh. designer. But again, a lot of it comes from our collection. So, you know, we can, we can really put together quite a, a range of exhibitions here just from our own collection. So you need to come visit us and take a look. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, I think everybody needs to come visit you. And I know we need to wait till it's all safe and all that, but you know, uh, that's going to end. We know that's going to have an end at some point and you, people should get in their cars and take a trip. Now no. about what you just said is very interesting to me because it's something we talk about here in Fort Wayne a lot, uh, when we didn't have a big collection, you know, you've got to bring a lot of things in from outside. Mm -hmm. When you've got a, a very deep and generous collection, you can actually do tremendous shows 
and it's from your collection and it's fresh and it's new and you change it up. And do you think people respond to that pretty well? Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, one of the things that makes it great when you have a big collection, it reduces your costs in terms of having to bring in big expensive shows from other locations. And we are not a wealthy museum. We're a lot of, like a lot of other smaller museums in the middle of the country. The ability to constantly build shows out of our collection that are based out of items that are swapped back and forth or items that sometimes haven't been seen in years or decades. It really provides a, a great wealth of material to build out of that I think institutions that don't have collections uh, really have that problem where they've got to rent and rent and rent endlessly, um, yes. which, is, which is not possible if you don't have a lot of money. That's ex exactly right. And it also, um, in, in many senses, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't bond your community to you as tightly when the shows always come from someplace else. Mm -hmm. And if, if I think I, I see people that are thrilled to find out, oh, my goodness, these are things we own. How <laughs> exciting. Yeah. And that happens all the time here. We had a show uh, based out of our modern collection a couple of years ago, and we had a, a Warhol print in it. That, that we own and a young woman who, who was maybe a, a, just into college saw it and took a photo of it and posted it on Facebook and said, I had no idea we had a real Warhol in Huntington. <laughs> yeah. And that was, you know, that's the exciting bit is that people are astounded constantly by the quality of the work that we have, uh, which is why we like to share it with places like yours. Well, I, I think it's, it's perfect and it's perfect to share like that too, because, you know, then, you know, in many ways I feel like, you both and my staff and myself, you know, we're in the trenches out here and we love to deliver beautiful art, insightful art to our audiences. And, you know, when, when you watch the various different glossy magazines, we get lo looked over. But the fact is the real good work is being done by us. Mm -hmm. And for us to be able to show an exhibit that you've put together is, is a point of pride for me. And, 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 I, and I hope it works for you too. Mm. Yeah, it's great. I think it's great that it's out there. Now, not to, that's not to say that our our visitors won't miss a lot of the things. Some of the pieces you have there, like Robert Henry's, <laughs> they're going to complain that we don't have. That. <laughs> we, well, you know, that's that was my next question for you. Actually, is mm -hmm. that when when the show is done touring, I bet this is this is great group of things that you want on display again. Oh yeah. But yeah. the Daywood is such a big collection and it, it'll go up again in the spring, what we have here. And we have, you know, since we have 400 works in that collection to take 40 out of there, it's not gonna destroy the show. You know, we've got plenty more where that came from. And so we can, we can put up the day when we've got a lot of great, uh, you know, things that, will, that will take the place of some of these, I mean, as much as possible, but there, you do have some of the favorites there that are on. Yes. Yeah, oh, I, I, I totally understand that. You know, mm -hmm. someone's going to say, oh, why did you have to pick that one to be in the 40 to travel? <laughs> That's right. And of course, yeah. the traveling show will go, go on for a, a year or two, correct? A couple of years, yes. A couple of years. Yeah, so I'm, if, I, if I'm in town, I got to be patient for a while. <laughs> my, my word. Yeah. Now, I have to say too that I'm glad that you got, that we could extend it at your museum also, uh, because uh, you know the it, it couldn't go to Lake Charles, Louisiana. They had the misfortune of being hit by two hurricanes. Uh, so it's great that you guys can continue to host it. I think. I mean, we, well, we, to tell you the truth, we we were quite thrilled because pe people were saying to us, you know. Could, I wish it were longer because I want to come back more and more and I think, well, actually, here's the good news. It can be. <laughs> it's going to work out quite well. Yeah. yeah. And do, do you see opportunities in the future? I mean, I'm asking a kind of a bigger museum question here. Do you see opportunities in the future for museums like our museum and your museum and, and, and some others in our in our group to do more of this collaborative kind of thing and share shows and share art? Yeah, and it's funny you should bring that up because I just had a meeting yesterday to talk about this topic exactly with two other regional museums that we're all very tired of getting poor treatment from the bigger institutions. 
Yeah. <laughs> and we want to work together because we all have great collections and we all have differing collections and we're all within reasonable distances from another. So why don't we work more together on creating shows out of each other's collections and, you know, come with our van and pick the stuff up and bring it back as opposed to have to, you know, uh, you know, have something on a, on a video screen watching us put something in a case live because they're worried we don't know how to handle it. Yes, I totally understand what you mean. We go through the same thing. And, and you know, I think that the grassroots kind of approach you're talking about, Jeffrey, is is the key to changing it all. You know, we, you know, we kind of don't need, you know, the bigger oversight. We kind of just need to get together. And we, we probably have many shared experiences and we probably have a lot of trust for each other. Right. Yeah. You know, you, you know, we're going to treat your work correctly and we would trust you're going to treat our work correctly. And, and, uh, you know, maybe we got to file a condition report, but you know, basically, I bet I'd take you on your word. We'll just do it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, the thing is, you just have to make an introduction, like this meeting tonight, right here. You know, we didn't know you beforehand. Now we do. Let's get together and work on some shows. That's what I say. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's kind of like. A key point for me of the whole evening. <laughs> this is so yeah. fun, and yeah. and that you know the Kennedy Museum, and and yeah. we we know a lot of people together. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's quite wonderful. Yeah. Uh, now, go back to the impression just for a minute, because somebody asked me a question uh, that I want to share with you. Is that the impressionist style, this looser style? Mm -hmm. You know, why why do you think that stayed popular after the French kind of waned? What was attractive about it to Americans? Well, I, I think I think it it was very pleasant, you know, very you know, happy kind of thing, you know, nice fields, flowers, you know, like like uh, you know, pictures of leisure, like like you have the Irving Wiles painting of uh, a woman sitting on a porch, you know, kind of the leisure time. You know, scenes on the beach, uh, you know, those kind of things, uh, you know, really sparked a lot of pleasant thoughts for people. And I think, I think impression, you know, the American impressionists really made a point of making kind of beautiful things. And, and Arthur Dayton, that was what he really liked about it. He thought modern art, like the, uh, you know, the, Think stuff that was at the Armory show. He thought it was, uh, you know, negative and, uh, you know, had, had a lot of uh, hopelessness connected with it. You know, and he really liked the beauty of the paintings he owned. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, we were very privileged not to suffer the depredations of World War One on our soil, and that totally transformed the scene in Europe. Just think about what it was before 1914 and what it was in 1919. Oh, that's a good point. When everything was destroyed and people had been through years and years of privation and just everything had a downtrodden look. And what comes out of you, you get all that the complete change in what art is being produced. We didn't have that. We were successful. We didn't have the fighting on our, you know, on our on our land. So everything could you know, continue forward at least until the time of the Great Depression. Here, when again, like what happened in World War I in Europe, suddenly there's a great change in what happens and how art is depicted. And so I think we got a, just a, a longer run out of it because we didn't experience those horrors. Oh, I, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, I think even when you add in the Great Depression and the Second World War, I think while there was a lot of art that was going to focus on angst and negativity and those things, uh, some of that art, if not much of that art, was out of tune with collectors who were really looking for signs of hope, mm -hmm. signs of spirituality, signs of, of health. Yeah. And, you know, intellectually, I get the whole point about the angst and irritations and things, but, you know, basically you're buying art that you want to collect and art that you're going to put in your home, uh, let's reflect some positivity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Not to say that we wished Arthur Dayton hadn't, you know, if we could go back in time and steer him towards some, you know, Arthur Dove or, you know, Marsden Hartley or something like that. But he, he really avoided all those, you know, the, the modernist painters of the day. Uh, you know, he, um, he, he, just, he just didn't like them. Yeah. And even later when Ruth was in charge, dealers were constantly getting her to think about buying some modernism works by really what we consider, you know, some of the great names today. And she would just keep running back saying, I don't like that stuff. Stop offering it to me. It's not, it's not what I want to own. That's not for me. That's <laughs> not for me. Now, I'm going to try to share a PowerPoint here. And we've got a couple of really great examples that I'd like you to speak to. Uh, let's see if I can get this up here. And I'm going to try to go to full screen here. If that works for you. Yeah. Okay. Ah, here we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, again, uh, Ruth Dayton, once she started the Daywood Gallery, she uh, had a goal of collecting works by each one of the eight, the American painting group, the eight that had shown at Macbeth Gallery. So Arthur Davies was part of that group. He was kind of a curious member of that group, I think, because, you know, his work, you know, the eight was really known for their ash can school look, you know, the realist look. And here Arthur Davies was doing these, uh, you know, mythological scenes and so on. But uh, again, that's why she bought that one. It's, you know, maybe a little bit out of character for the for the Daytons, actually. But uh, again, because he was part of the eight that came through Macbeth Gallery, who she worked very closely with, that was the reason she bought that one. Well, it's, it's a gorgeous painting. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And... It's so thoroughly modern, but it's also very uh, sentimental and gorgeous. Uh -huh. And again, you know, because Arthur Dayton, I mean, he was not alive when they, she bought this painting, but, uh, you know, he was a very literary man. So it seems to me like this one would be one he would have really liked as well. But you can see the really modernist elements in that painting, the real high horizon there. I mean, if you walk out the figure kind of, it looks like a, an abstract painting almost, you know, so. Uh, well, it, it does, the flatness of the, of the water in the background. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Yeah. John Fulton Fulton. Talk to me about it. Uh, it's, I mean, talk about a, just a great impressionist painting. Um, it, uh, there's something about it, when it's up in the gallery, I can't, stop myself from pausing in front of it and looking at it. There's just something about the, the winter beauty of it, but also that we're looking at a very industrial scene, a city that's sort of built, you know, on industry. Um, and it, it does have that grimy feel in some ways, but then again, the beauty of that fresh snow in the foreground that sort of just, it, it just makes it, you know, beautiful. Um, and this is, again, this is one of these works that they got, uh, that had won a major prize, if I remember correctly, Chris. That's right. Won, yeah. won second yeah. prize. It was it was it at the Carnegie or the Philadelphia show? It was at the Sesquicentennial. The Philadelphia Sesquicentennial. Mm -hmm. And um, the yeah. Daytons were very lucky. They ended up stumbling into a lot of prize-winning paintings that either won prizes right after they bought them, or that had been prize winners that they were able to scoop up from other people's estates. And this is one of them. And it's just a, a gorgeous yeah. painting. Yeah. And I I always thought this was kind of a, a cross between uh, the Impressionist and the Ashcan school, you know, it showed that kind of gritty industrial look, you know, but also uses a lot of the Impressionist uh, colors and technique, the, you know, the brushwork and light and so on. So, you know, I, I think it is one of the, the good paintings in that show. Yeah, it, it's, it's a terrific combination of, of the two, really. 
uh, Styles because it, it he knows what he's after here, uh, mm -hmm. and he's going to come at it from two different angles. And you you feel the grittiness, but you know the the, the covering of snow and the feeling of the cold in some sense. Uh, the painting kind of wraps its arms around you. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a warmer painting, even though it is a very cold painting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a it's, great uh, story too because John Fallensby took the train and you know the train was stopped there and he made a sketch of that that scene and you know from the train and went home and painted it. So yeah, it's a great story. Well, and you know that's that's an aspect of creation that most of our visitors aren't clued into. You, you know, did he live there? Did he travel there? How did he happen to see the scene? Yeah. Uh, and a lot of this is happenstance, right? Yeah. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Fallensby, had, when he was a youngster, he contracted polio. So he was in a wheelchair. And so he would ride in a car that, you know, so that, you know, like not the regular passenger car. So, it gave him the opportunity to have room to sketch and so on when he was on the train. Well, and I, I, I think that uh, one of the things that we all probably try to stress to our visitors is that the, the artist's eye is always on the lookout for a composition, for a scene. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they, could be, they could be visiting there for a minute or they could live nearby for a long time, but they know good composition when they see it or they know good scenes when they see it and they put it into a good composition and it, this is certainly a brilliant one yeah yeah that's great and and, and the palette as well mm -hmm. yeah so jeffrey you're admitting you miss this when it's on the road to us <laughs> i do miss that painting it, it is one of my favorites in the daywood collection yeah i i can see why uh -huh. and do they have others by this artist uh well, yes I, I think you've got another one the shad boat oh you're right yeah, yep. there's another one in there. Uh -huh. yep. Yeah, yeah, and again, it's a different. You know, when you see his technique in that other painting, I, I don't think you have a slide of it, but it's much more like Cezanne or someone. You know, the the technique he's using. So I think he was experimenting like a lot of American painters were at the time. You know, you raise a good point there, Chris, too, because I think that uh, from our perspective today, we probably don't fully appreciate that there was such a, you know, revolution of styles and revolution of composition and approaches in this day that people, you know, you wanted to experiment. You wanted to try, uh, would this be better for you or that be better for you? And, you know, that's, I, that happens still, but it happens less obviously than it happened then, I think. Right. Yeah. We uh, we have a Jackson Pollock, small Jackson Pollock, mm. when he was studying with Benton. And mm -hmm. so here's a small Jackson Pollock that looks like a Benton. And okay. we've got a small Benton, and he's trying to figure out what Pollock might know. <laughs> and it's very easy for for even the curators to misjudge which one's the Benton and which one's the Pollock. Well, it's the reverse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in the end, they, you know, as we know, they both rejected each other's styles mm -hmm. and found their own. But it's really lovely to see that, in fact, at one point, they were kind of entertaining the idea of maybe I could be like that <laughs> or like this. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to show you those sometime. Okay, yeah. yeah. We'll show you, uh, we have a great Thomas Hart Benton drawing from West Virginia. Um, he eventually made a print of it, but it's a, a strike at a coal mine. But we've got a, a, the, the drawing he used to make the print. But anyway, so sounds like we're already working on an exchange here. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. I yeah. think you're right. And, and you know, one, one thing that, I'm going really off track here, but I can't resist bringing it up. Uh, we, over the past, four, maybe four, four and a half years, uh, we, we've taken in probably 14 different archives from artists, not archives of their letters, but archives of their work, so that yeah. there would be an institution that preserved, you know, at least 100 
you know, sometimes as much as 150, 200 pieces of their work. And David Shapiro, a painter and printmaker from the pretty, pretty popular in the 80s, is one of those artists. It's, it's superb abstract work. And we're having a 100th anniversary next year. And part of my goal for the 100th anniversary is, is to give 100 pieces away. So uh, you might find a note from me soon offering you <laughs> a selection from a dozen or so of those works. Uh, mm -hmm. We just think that if you don't have David in the collection and you'd like to have him, we want to make it easy for you to have him. We'll drive him to you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was a visiting artist here back in the 80s or 70s, 70s or 80s. That, that would fit. Yeah, That's yeah. Wonderful. I think he was here. The this West Virginia had a program, and we hosted uh, teaching artists coming in to do these workshops. And I think I'm quite sure he was one of them. So, so we have a connection with him. I think. Yeah. Well, you know, after we're done today, tomorrow, take a look and see what you have and what you don't have. And uh, I, I'm certain we can send you a, a birthday present for our hundredth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a fun thing to do. I'm going to go to one more slide here. Okay. There's a painting I really love. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. And, and we really like him because he's a West Virginian. He was ah. West Virginia. And, uh, Tell me about him. Yeah. Uh, well, he uh, studied in Europe. and uh, But what really changed the course of his career was going out west and starting to, you know, he, I think he traded some paintings to, for, uh, you know, a chance to tour the west, but, you know, he really took off when he started doing, we have a couple of works by him, but this one really did incorporate a lot of the uh, impressionist painting style, um, much more so than the other painting that we have. Well, and you know, the style fits the action here so mm -hmm. well. You, you just feel, you know, in a, in a very naturalistic way, you feel the momentum of those horses and riders. Right. And the, the great light on the landscape, yeah. you know, beyond them. Right. And of course, that was an emphasis of the American Impressionist was recording that momentary light there. And you can see that in that, that painting. Now see, this is where I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take Jeffrey's position. When this one leaves, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna hurt. Yeah, yeah gonna that hurt. is a it's a great painting. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, Lee just had such a spectacular career after he left West Virginia um, and headed out west. And I mean, this is what he became known for. But I mean, this is actually a fairly simple work by him of a Western scene. We have you know, you'll see others that are uh, incredibly complicated fight scenes between Native Americans and American Indians. Uh, I mean, it really, it really speaks to uh, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, chasing, you know, something they're hunting, whether it's a human or an animal out in the wilderness of the West, and just the speed at which it's even painted. You can see in the, the back of the tail of that one horse, it's just quickly dabbed and, and, yeah. and touched uh, by the artist. It's amazing. Well, it, con it conveys the urgency and the speed. It's perfect, it does. really. It really does. Well, in, in rounding up, let me unshare for a minute. In, in rounding up, what would, what would you both like to share in, in closing about your museum, of which uh, I think so many people are fond, and I, I'm, I'm your newest, biggest fan, I have to say. Tell us some things we need to know. Well, I'll start it out by saying a lot of people, they have sort of low expectations for West Virginia. <laughs> you know, they, they don't believe, you know, a major interstate comes through Huntington. There's a sign for the museum. People get off there. I don't know what they're expecting, but usually they're pleasantly shocked when they get in our building and see what we have here. Uh, we've got such a rich, deep collection that, uh, you know, what you're seeing is only a small portion. For each one of those you have, we probably have a couple more as good or, you know, or better than, than those. Uh, so 
uh, again, if we if we work something out here, maybe we can exchange some things. But uh, you know, oh, yeah, I'd love for you and your staff and people that your your visitors come pay us a visit if they're you know if they're heading down south sometime. Uh, you know, we're not that far off the beaten path from Cincinnati or Lexington or no, or not at all. Very easy to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very easy. Um, I, you know, I'd like to just add to what Chris said. I think, you know, many museums are in downtowns and they are the museum and they don't really have much else around them. You know, we are nestled in 52 acres on top of a, 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 a hilltop. We've got trails surrounding the museum and outdoor sculpture. We had the National Council for the Arts here several years ago. And when they arrived and they stepped out of the bus, this one woman looked around and said, this is an oasis. And, that, and that's what it is. It really is. You, when you come up to the museum, it's not in that bustling downtown with, you know, uh, you know uh, with garbage, you know, strewn around on the street in front of it and with people who uh, don't have anywhere else to go, just sitting there bothering your patrons. You have to make an effort to come up here. And when you do, you find great art, beautiful grounds, a great trail system. And I think, uh, as Chris said, it just people are pleasantly shocked when they see the quality of what we have at our institution. Well, and, and I think that's probably delighted everyone who's ever stopped. I, I would, I want to add to that the fact that you and your staff are such a great group of people that here's the other thing. You're, you're very welcoming people and accessible people. And I think every visitor is surprised to find that we in the museum world actually are kind of, normal, happy people that like to see you here. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, we yeah. like to show our stuff off, you know? Yeah, yeah, we're so proud of it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when this traveling thing, when the traveling ban ends, I gotta tell you, I think we wanna lo load up a bus with, with our supporters and, and uh, our docents and stuff and make a great road trip because I wanna share everything that you've shared with us tonight with them and I'm sure they'd be delighted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Welcome. I've, I've got to thank you both for for being on the program tonight. Mm. I, I want to thank you for sharing your exhibit. And I'm I'm so delighted that we have actually quite a few points of commonality that we can act upon after this. Yeah, yeah. So Definitely. my best to you. My mm. thanks to you. I hope you have a both a great evening tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yep. Thank you very much, Charles. Thanks for being on. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.